So what, what you've been up to, Florian, lately? Uh, first of all, like, I mean, maybe some um, of the viewers wouldn't know you, even though I yeah. <laughs> kind of imagine, it's difficult to imagine that anyone wouldn't know you, at least in Android world, for sure. sure. But maybe just give us a little bit of introduction about yourself. Yeah, my name is Florian Walter, and most people know me from my YouTube channel, Coding in Flow, where I used to make Android tutorials, but uh, I don't really like doing that anymore. I just don't like, the, the problem is I'm, I became really good at making tutorials, but I hate the process of it. I never really liked it so much. So these days I put more um, focus on trying to build my own. So my, my dream basically is to build my own software startup, but not something that's funded because I've, uh, that seems so stressful. If you have, uh, if you have investment money and then you have to hire people, I want to build something myself basically. So bootstrapped. Yeah. And at the moment, the project I'm working on is called toothhub.io and that's, uh, that's where my focus is at the moment. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely discuss all of that in much more detail. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, you are very interesting. First of all, I I wanted to talk to you for a very, very long time. But you yeah, we never accessible. had the opportunity. Yeah, never yeah. had an opportunity. And also you said, I think, publicly at some point that you are not um, very interested in podcasts. Yeah, so at first I, I didn't want to I do didn't it. Bother, I didn't want to I, bother you, but then I saw yeah. that uh, at least Rob managed to get you on his podcast and then you started creating your own podcast. Yeah, the, uh, at Rob J's podcast was the very first time I did something like this because I was really anxious about it. I was really, uh, normally this kind of stuff makes me very nervous. And the, the first time I talked on Rob's podcast, I was really nervous. <laughs> the first few minutes, my heart was pounding like crazy because this is just... This kind of stuff makes me uh, socially anxious. But then I, uh, then it went well, and then I did my own podcast, and then I got used to it. So now it's okay. Which is now kind of surprising, because by the time uh, Rob hosted you, you've had, what, several hundreds of hours of videos on YouTube by that point. Yeah, right? but it was never, yeah, it was never, okay, the podcast wasn't live either. But when I make my own videos, I, I'm in full control. If I uh, do some something bad then i can just remove it and of course rob did also remove stuff that uh, didn't fit into the podcast but in my own videos i just feel like i have full control over the end result and if i make a fool of myself i can just not show it that's why i was never really but actually when i recorded my tutorials i sometimes was nervous as well but i think it was more because of i i knew that i needed to focus now and not screw it up not so much because of social anxiety, but now it's yeah. Okay. I always found it's very um, fascinating because um, you are not the type of a stereotype YouTuber, right? Like you are not I trying to be. Uh, in my experience, right, everyone sees it differently. But when I um, look at big YouTubers, right, it's usually like very high energy people. They are trying to look nice. They are trying to make it interesting. And then we've got your videos, which are basically like just right to the point, very technical. You're not trying to please anyone. You just share what you learn along the way. And somehow you build the biggest Android channel out there, right? I'm, I'm not mistaken. There's there no one bigger than you. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, um, I mean, the the Google uh, Google's own Android developers channel has almost a million or has a million by now. So this one is bigger, but from the people who do it. Um, yeah, but I'm sure that you've got lot, lots more views than them. Yeah. And yeah, doing entertaining stuff is not my strength. I just can't, uh, I just can't do it. I'm just so boring. sorry, folks, if you tuned in for some stand up comedy, that's not, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not exactly what you're going to get here. I, I mean, when I made my Unity uh, tutorial for the Unity engine game development, I tried to do some jokes and people actually liked it, but it was more try humor and not this uh, extroverted kind of humor where you smile all the time. And that's just not something I can do. 
Just yeah, you've got, it. you've got, I remember you've got, first of all, you've got this video of one day in uh, YouTuber yeah. life or something like that, right? Which was uh, crazy funny. I remember I loved it my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> and then very yeah. lately, you also shared the video of uh, something like coding, uh, being a coder, reality yeah, versus this was recent. imagination. Yeah, this was a recent video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these are definitely uh, parody comedy uh, videos and even though you're not trying to be funny i find them like i found them exceptionally funny i actually yeah, well in these videos i try to be funny yeah but it's uh i just can't do this kind of stuff that that many youtubers do where they uh, I, I mean i saw some videos where youtubers actually started recording too earlier and they forgot to cut it out and some of them what they do is that they smile before they start recording they smile really uh, really hard um <laughs> I mean, not like you would smile in reality, but they really try to put their um, their mouth yeah. all the way to their ear. And they do this so when they then later start recording, they have um, a bit more of a um, a friendly look to them because they just pulled their uh, their mouth all the way up. It's it's a kind of technique, I guess, to look more friendly when you record a video. But, yeah, I think it's also uh, kind of backed in psychological research because... I kind of um, listen to all kinds of psychology podcasts and neuroscience podcasts. So you probably know the Huberman Lab podcast with yeah. Huberman. Uh, and also, I'm into sports a little bit. And there's this uh, sports psychology stuff. And actually, I think there is like a very um, robust research indicating that once you smile, even if you're not really happy, it mm. kind of creates... Yeah, um, yeah I had that too. Yeah, it's you create, become creates, more happy. Exactly, it creates some kind of yeah. um, internal um, neuro neurological feedback mm. that go, makes your I don't know what happiness hormones go up. Uh, I'm yeah. not a neuroscientist myself, but I know that for example in trainings I do a little bit of Muay Thai, so um, my uh, my trainers they always tell that um, like you need to smile a little bit. Okay, smile yeah. when you when you're in a fight. You need to smile quickly because first of okay. all, it scares it scares your opponent because they think you are absolutely crazy and fighting a crazy person. <laughs> no one wants to be there. But also, it creates some kind of internal feedback that raises your level of energy, that raises your confidence. So maybe yeah, they definitely. they do it like like that. Even though I never thought about doing it myself, but I'll definitely give it a try after that. Yeah, a lot of stuff works like that. Also motivation itself, like sometimes you don't want to do something and then you just start, you start moving first and then suddenly uh, you get into it and it becomes more fun. So often it's it's action before the feeling and not the other way around. And yeah, this works, but I also, when I do this stuff, it feels just like I'm lying in front of the camera when I try to be a, or look like someone I'm not. So I, I didn't really like that. I'm just not an extroverted I mean, I'm happy internally, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not someone who smiles all the time and is extroverted and full of energy. That's just not my my, my mood. Yeah. And you are from Germany, right? You're German, right? Right. Would you say that it's something that is like a cultural thing as well? No, it's a it's a cliche, I think, but that's more because of our language because we have these aggressive sounding noises <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> but. No, most people uh, are not like me here in Germany. They are not. Um, I'm just. Uh, I'm just someone who is naturally quiet, and looks a bit sad to to other people on the outside. But um, the same stuff that people tell me on the internet to smile more and be happier and stuff like that. The same. It's the same stuff that they tell me here in Germany all the time when people see me at parties and my own family. They always tell me to smile more. Mm, interesting, yeah. because I know for sure that there is a cultural component to that because I came from Russia and I have a, a family in Russia. And mm. undoubtedly, like Russians smile much less and they're much more introverted as a whole. Of course, you've had you know, mm. different people. Some are, someone is more introverted, someone less introverted, but on average, comparing Russia to Israel, Russians are so much more introverted and they smile mm. so much less so that's yeah, that's um, why i asked. I think that's not the case for germans not as far as i know great great so you've started your um 
I mean, I don't know how you started your career. Maybe you will tell us about that a little bit, but you rose to prominence as a YouTuber. And have you had any experience before you started recording your YouTube videos? I started learning to code uh, in 2017, I think, uh, in July. And I think I started the channel in October. So I started the channel really soon after I started learning to code. And I started with Android and then I sticked with it for a few years. But and I didn't have coding did experience start? before that. Um, you mean coding or the YouTube channel or both? I asked about YouTube channel, but actually when I think uh, about it, coding is also a very interesting question. How old were you when you started your coding career? It, it was one month before turning 27, I th yeah, 27. When you said? It was, uh, or it was 1st of July, I think, and end of July I turned 27. Yeah, because I didn't like doing the thing I did before anymore. And I, uh, I don't know, in my early 20s, I studied business economics that I was not interested in. This was just a waste of time. I never really focused much on what do, what I want to do with my life. I don't know why, but um, it was only later that I started uh, thinking about that stuff. And because what I was doing before was something that bored me and I hated it, then I, uh, I actually sat down and thought, what do I want to do every day now for the rest of my life? What, what do I want to work with? And then I would just, I don't know, I, I went through, through uh, different ideas. And then I remember that I enjoyed coding as a child. I had some, I did some um, programming as a child, but nothing advanced because it was too complicated for me back then. Mm -hmm. But the little bits I, I uh, was doing was fun for me. So at almost 27, I thought I should give it another try. And then I started learning to code basically from zero because you can't count a little bit of experience from my childhood at all. And then uh, I liked it and then I stick to it. And I'm happy that I uh, got back to coding because it's just, I think it's the, it's the only kind of work that I can really, uh, I mean, there are probably other things I would enjoy too, but I think programming is just what I enjoy the most that can also be a career. So I'm really happy that I got back into coding. I don't know what I would do otherwise now. No idea. And the YouTube channel, I don't really know why I started the YouTube channel. I just thought, I think I just understood that it's a nice way to, uh, to uh, market myself because I wasn't sure if it's too late to start coding at almost 27, if it will be harder to get a job. So I naturally understood that making videos will maybe raise my chances later that someone discovers me or is impressed by what I can do because I show it to the outside. And I think I also thought... Well, it worked. Yeah, it, it does work. I mean, it's the same for writing blog posts and stuff like that. It just puts attention on you and you can get job opportunities this way. But I also, also thought if I can make some ad revenue and I make videos about the stuff that I'm learning anyway, then I can basically get paid for learning. And this worked as well because I was learning this stuff anyway. And then I just made videos about it. And then after a while, if you get enough clicks, then you make some ad revenue on YouTube and you basically get paid for learning. I mean, it's not that simple because of course, making videos is a lot of effort, but this was uh, my uh, train of thought I had back then. And this is how I started this YouTube channel. No. Yeah, so you've been doing these YouTube videos for several years now. Hmm. Grew to become um, the biggest spot, the biggest like content producer video at least for Android. Um, exceptionally high reach. I mean, there are yeah, Android is not a popular topic on YouTube for some reason. I think it's of all the programming topics, Android is probably one of the least popular ones. I don't know why. Really, it also has to. Yeah, um, I mean. Uh, I have some videos that got a few hundred thousand clicks over a long period of time, but I never had these raging fans like other YouTubers where you release a new video and you have 30,000 views after a day or stuff like that. On Android, this was never the case. It was always the slow process. And also, as far as I know, when I compare with other YouTubers, 
in our we have we have this discord channel where a lot of these tech youtubers are in and they make a lot more ad revenue per thousand views than i do <laughs> i don't know why android has the lowest ad revenue but it's much lower than everyone else ah well that's a very simple question to answer because um many many first of all android is open source and free and the community is free so people are doing free work basically all around in android world and um android developers i think it's very very clear that majority of them come from lower gdp countries say yeah, india, india pakistan so. etc mm -hmm. and by definition lower gdp countries uh, produce low lower per yeah. week, uh, revenue so that's that's yeah. not surprising at all but what's surprising is that android is not as popular as other um technology yeah, surprising. topics yeah. because considering that it's so big yeah. yeah in my estimation android is if not the biggest so one of let's say three biggest technology mm. stacks out there because there are like millions of android developers so it's very surprising maybe just the medium of youtube isn't working that well or maybe just you know people in android because Unlike many other um, tech communities, tech in fact, how to call it, tech ecosystems, in Android we actually have like Google trying to rule and compete with mm -hmm. basically all uh, open source and tech uh, and content creators, etc. So maybe they kind of take the bulk of of the traffic to themselves, and then mm -hmm. people don't look that much outside of Google's let's say guidelines, etc. And in yeah, my so experience. That... Yeah, yeah, go on. Oh, no. What I was uh, going to say that just that my channel is the biggest with a bit more than 200,000 subscribers already shows that it's pretty small because there are many web YouTubers, web development YouTubers that have more than a million or a few million. And I think even the official Android channel by Google has only a million or something. It's not that many people. But there are not that many Android developers for some reason compared to other platforms. Yeah. Either that YouTube. or there are just, I, I think like I estimated the number of Android developers in the world and I think there are several millions of them. I think Android mm -hmm. is, if not the most popular platform ecosystem, then it's definitely in top three. And mm -hmm. just maybe, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Why there's not that much interest in YouTube content. And also I guess, you know, <laughs> JavaScript, for example, Hmm. It's kind of an interesting niche because I think most people who look for JavaScript tutorials do not necessarily code or work in JavaScript. Hmm. So there is a lot of people who just, you know, kind of want to see stuff, hmm. want to try stuff, maybe learn stuff in the in the universities, schools, etc. So I, I will estimate that a lot of interest comes from there. And Android, and that's something that actually I want to ask you, um, we will discuss to have IO in great detail mm. a little bit later, but now you switched basically to being a full stack developer, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And how would you stack the difficulty of developing an in Android to being a full mm. stack developer working in JavaScript environment? Yeah, I find Android much more difficult. And I think that's mostly, I mean, when you think about why Android is so difficult, it's mostly because of the memory limitations we have because of these small devices. I mean, this is why you have process dev, for example, or this is why you need view recycling and a recycler viewer. It's all because of memory limitations, right? Because you can't keep so much stuff in memory at the same time. But on, on my website, I don't do any real, uh, view re recycling. I don't know if I should, if there's an equivalent to that. I mean, I do pagination, of course, but no view recycling. And you don't have process dev on the website as well, where you put the, it, it, uh, where you put the website into the background and then the, the system kills it, like it happens on Android. Also, you don't have configuration changes like on Android, which causes a lot of problems. I mean, this is why we have to put all the stuff into view models, because when we rotate the screen or do stuff like that, then uh, the data on the, this component is lost in this activity. And on the web, you don't have this. You just, uh, in React, for example, I just fetch data on in whatever component I need it. And it's also, uh, the, the variable that saves this data is also in this component. 
Whereas on Android, I always have to move everything to the view model and then the view model has to communicate back to the UI. So this is much more complicated on Android than on web. I, I found it so far easier. But maybe if I learned web first and then Android because of the prior experience, maybe I would say the same because I already know a lot of stuff. Maybe it's just because it's my second platform that it seems easier to me. But I really think that Android is more difficult. Or don't you think so compared to other platforms? I find Android the most difficult of all I, hmm. I, I've tried. And I know that people consider backend development to be some kind of the most difficult, the most important part. Hmm. And in my experience, Android is just so much more difficult than backend development. There's the other part that if you screw up in backend, then yeah, the that's consequences what I was about of that. To say. Right. Yeah, I'm always a bit tense when I do stuff on my server, when I change code, I'm always a bit tense because you can really screw things up and then you can do a lot of damage that you yeah, can't yeah. really do on the front end. Yeah, I mean, like if you if you lose data on the backend side or yeah. you create some, or you bring the server down, then the consequences of something like that will be much greater mm. than, let's say, releasing a version of Android with a bug. So there is that, yeah. but conceptual coding practices coding like a developer and understanding what's going on and also the ramp up. I find that on Android much more difficult. And even that, even even the, the consequences part is just about simple applications, right? So if you have Android application, like a web application, you just fetch data from the server, you display it somehow, mm -hmm. you know, you navigate between the screens, then yeah, sure, that's not, not not that much stuff there. But once you start talking about, let's say, full offline mode, when you've got uh, basically the entire database, you've got basically backend inside your Android device because you need to sync data and you need your uh, application to work in offline. Then the consequences of screwing something up there is also very severe, might be very severe. So yeah, I would say Android is among all things that I know about. Uh, and I don't haven't tried iOS development. I would imagine that it's very similar to Android in this sense. Android is definitely the, definitely the most difficult thing that I tried. And I also tried backend. You know, I I developed a little bit of Spring, a little bit of uh, uh, other Java backend systems, and also Node.js lately. So mm. um, definitely Android, I find it more difficult than others, and in many instances, unnecessarily so. Also testing, for example, seems diff more difficult to set up yeah. on Android. You always have all these uh, all these loops you have to or hoops you have to go through before yeah. it works. And with JavaScript so far, um, it's just easier to set up. Also, uh, I never really had to think about dependency injection at all. I think on uh, I don't even know how uh, dependency uh, injection. Uh, um, works with JavaScript, but in Node.js, I just have these modules that I import. And that's basically it. So you're not really calling any constructors there where you pass any arguments. I don't, it's, it just, it just feels like, uh, I don't have to think about this at all. It just works. Do you use pure JavaScript or TypeScript? No, TypeScript. I switched but to TypeScript. I, uh, I couldn't imagine building this once it is a little bit bigger, I can't imagine just using JavaScript anymore. It seems super stressful if you just can put any variable anywhere. And I, I'm, I'm a fan of TypeScript. Yeah, it's really nice. So for sure, Android is more difficult. And again, it brings us back to what you said, that uh, in your estimation, Android is not that very popular of a topic on mm -hmm. YouTube, which would which is surprising given Android is more difficult than JavaScript, but maybe it's not surprising actually. Maybe like people just look for something simpler. There's also no Android channel that is really, uh, I mean, there are many uh, web development channels and other programming topics where people have this really active fan base where they release a video and they get, I don't know, tens or hundreds of thousands of viewers in a short time frame. There is no uh, channel on Android about Android that has this kind of um, this kind of fan base. Uh, Philip Lackner is also now a very popular YouTube channel about Android. And he, uh, he, is, uh, he has a lot of fans. And 
is probably the best Android channel at the moment, but even he doesn't get these tons of views in a short time frame. But if you have web development channels, like, I don't know, Web Dev Simplified, for example, is one, they just, they can release a video and sometimes they get tons of views in a short time frame. But on Android, there is no channel that really has this kind of views. There is also another aspect of that, which I don't know how to, like, whether it's a play or not, but, um, Web development ecosystem is an open ecosystem, right? So there are shitload of frameworks there. Yeah, that's and true. People constantly invent new things, and yeah, there's a lot true. of interest. And Android, even though it's kind of advertised as open source ecosystem, but in practice it's not. You cannot create, well, at least people try it, but it's a very bad idea to create your own frameworks for Android, full frameworks. Hmm. Let's say like uh, Mavericks, right? Have you heard about that? It's something that Airbnb created. It used to I be- I only M know the name. But I MVRX, don't know what and then it, it became Mavericks. I wouldn't use anything like, like that in Android just mm. because fundamentally Android is controlled by Google. And therefore mm. <laughs> we need to live by their rules. And that's not something that applies to web. In web, you can tomorrow create completely new um, framework from scratch and start yeah, advertising do. it. And people will probably just like it, you know, developers like new mm. things. And if you can create a completely new framework and you can create a video combining, I don't know, Vue.js to React to Angular mm. to, to something else, then it's kind of a very interesting stuff because web developers, it's simple. They don't have much to do. So they constantly look for another refactoring, another, a new framework. Not something in Android. Android people actually <laughs> are mm. very concerned with just, you know, keeping the lights on and, and the applications running. Yeah. So your YouTube channel, as we said, is one of the most popular, probably the most popular. In yeah, Android but I have to world. say that it, I do, it, now it's dead because I don't make these tutorials. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly I what I want do to some, ask. I don't do some update video. Now it's dead. I, yeah, I, that's I, exactly I, what I, I want to ask. And news. you decide at some point, you know, you, you reach this peak. And yeah. at some point you decided to just cut it. Because yeah, that's the point of doing you this didn't if like. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't want to make tutorials for more years. I just don't like it. The thing is that hurts a bit. I could make a ton of money creating courses. You can, uh, it's also much more realistic and much easier than building your own tech startup is to uh, create a course business. And I already have all the followers that I need basically, but I just hate the process so much. And I don't want to work on a course for a month or two months and hate every day of it. So I try to build, my dream really is to build a real tech startup, so to speak, but bootstrapped. So I want to work on it alone or maybe with a small team, but I don't want investment and I don't want to have to hire people at the beginning because then uh, it's just much more difficult, I think, because then just making money from it is not enough. You also have to make more money than you burn. And this seems to be very difficult and most people fail with that. My, uh, my idea is to have a, a small bootstrapped indie startup where I just built something myself. And even, even if it only makes a hundred bucks a month, I would already consider this a success um, just because it's a nice feeling to create something that makes money. And this is what I want to, I don't know if that, I don't know how realistic that is. Some people say uh, it's, uh, it's just very unlikely. On the other hand, there are many indie hackers that build these small tools and make money from them. People and a say lot of these, unlikely yeah, what? Yeah. yeah, unlikely to, um, I mean, it's generally uh, unlikely that you build a startup and it succeeds. The, the chance is pretty low for that. But yeah, on the other hand, you see people that build these small products and make money from it. And I don't know if, if it's more difficult to build a quote unquote real startup where you get investment and everything and have to hire people. If that's more difficult than building a small indie lifestyle startup where you just work on it yourself in your free time and just, I mean, there is no real risk to that because I'm not burning through money. I don't have to pay anyone. So if it makes a hundred bucks a month, I can't live from that, but I wouldn't consider it a failure if it was fun, if I learned something in the process. So it doesn't really seem really risky. But what of course can happen is that you uh, invest a lot of time and then you don't get anything out of it. But I don't really have a problem with that because I also learn a lot of stuff in the process where I kill two birds with one stone. And you enjoy. So, 
yeah, I, I do enjoy it, but if I knew that it wouldn't give me anything in return it, at all, then I wouldn't do it, of course, because it's a lot of time I put in there. But just learning all the stuff in the process is already worth it, in my opinion. I mean, I learned all web development just by building two small projects. This one, Tutab, and the one uh, another ex Chrome extension I built before. This is how I uh, taught myself web development. And even if the projects themselves don't bring me any money, I still learned web development. So I don't really see a, a risk in that. Yeah. And how do you sustain yourself while you're building your SaaS company? Um, it's a mix between, I mean, one part is ad revenue. My YouTube channel still gets clicks from all the old videos. I do some sponsorships where I give a shout out to a company and you can actually make nice money from that if you have a bigger YouTube channel. Um, and I also sometimes work small freelance gigs when I need more money. But at the moment, my uh, approach to this is I only work and do sponsorships as much as I need to uh, pay my bills. And all the remaining time, as much time as possible, I try to work on my own my own projects, which also means that I don't have money in my real life to uh, for all kinds of stuff. So I'm 32 now, and I drive my mother's old bicycle bicycle everywhere when I have to go somewhere. So this is the price I have to pay. I don't have a lot of money, but I can pay my bills, and I. Uh, I work as much as I need to pay my bills and the rest of the time goes into my projects. And maybe sometime, some time in the future it pays out because one of these projects take off or I, or one day I'll be 40 years old and completely broke <laughs> and don't get anything out of it. But I feel like um, if I just uh, try some stuff, then eventually something will work out. And if it doesn't, then I just start a job with the stuff I've learned, right? I can still become a normal developer in a company. Yeah, and the freelance projects that you mentioned, what kind of projects these are? Android. Yeah, the last one was, yeah, the last one was a Chrome extension. Um, from someone I knew, he brought me to that job, and I just built a Chrome extension for someone. And this is also something I learned uh, before when I built my own Chrome extension. This is what I mean. Uh, why it's not a waste of time because I learned these skills, and. Uh, building Chrome extensions doesn't seem very popular either. So uh, I think there are not many, so many people that know how to build a Chrome extension. And it was a skill that was useful then. And then I did a job and I knew already knew how to do all this stuff. So your clients come from the word of mouth. You do not, yeah. you do not use any freelancing website. You do not advertise nothing. Just no, I mean, people I'm on who LinkedIn. know you. Yeah. yeah, it's all because of my channel, basically. I am on LinkedIn and sometimes people contact me, but I never did any work through there because they usually want you to work full-time, but I only want to do a um, part-time. But yeah, all the jobs I got so far were people that knew me from my YouTube channel, basically. I also get emails often. Of course, in the past, it was more often when I was still making Android videos mm -hmm. where people would ask me if I want to build the, the app for them. And of course, 90% of these offers are trash because they think they can pay you like two bucks an hour or 10 <laughs> bucks for the whole app. But from time to time, there's a, a reasonable one between them. And have and, you taken any of these? Um, yeah, in the past, I just have to think back what kind of jobs I did. But I did a few in the past. Yeah, I did some. There was a time where I tried to do more freelancing. Then I worked on some projects. Yeah. And how do and you I'll, find freelancing? Is it fulfilling or you just kind of struggle through it to make money and that's it? No, when I work on someone else's project, my motivation is just zero. zero. <laughs> when I work on my own project, it's so much fun. But as soon as it's someone else's project, for some reason, I'm just not invested in it. And then I just want to get over with it. I but honestly of course I do the envy work you so necessary. much because for me, it's completely reversed. And it's so perverse that when I work on someone else's project, I'm 100 committed, 100 committed and motivated, and once mm. it gets to my That's projects, I became like a lazy shit and I, and I hate myself. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. That's very strange. But I, would That's very strange. but I would almost prefer it your way because um, working for someone else is just a really direct 
way to make money and it works and there's no risk or not much risk involved with that. So I would be I, happy if I could enjoy working on others' projects and I would just probably do it all the time. I think it's, it depends on what people look for in their life. So, for example, in my estimation, most people, they don't want to be freelancers. They don't want to be entrepreneurs. They want mm. a steady job, good income, you know, no surprises. And for these people, it's amazing. There are also people who like freelancing because they use the, they really use the, the freedom that comes with that. Let's say yeah. so-called digital nomads, people who live every month in other country. And I've had this opportunity, like I've been able to do that for a couple of years now, and I've never done this. So for me, all of that is just a kind of, I try to sustain myself like you do. And I'm mm. also, you could call me broke. You know, I do freelancing for a lot of, for a lot of time and I'm kind of, uh, let's say, paid more than average. Let's put mm. it that way. But still, I, you know, I don't own a fancy car and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and the either. reason is that I also want to build my own startup. I, and, and I have, I tried several times before and all of these were complete utter failures. Mm. So I wasted a lot of money and a lot of time on trying to build my own startup. And still, I, I do want to do that going forward. So I fully understand you. And given that our intention, yours and mine, is to build a startup, I would say that if you're motivated working on your own stuff, mm -hmm. then it's a, definitely a better set of skills and um, interests than when you're motivated working on someone else's stuff if you want to build your own project. Because I I see your project, to Tutabayo, and it's amazing. It constantly improves and you build something really useful. And I think you kind of underestimate what you can achieve with it. Hmm. Because I mean it uh, it made it made um it made like eight bucks from affiliate links already. So I guess that's a success. I mean it cost me eighty bucks per month to maintain the server and any, everything, but it make it made eight bucks from uh, Udemy affiliate links. I just need much more traffic, um, and that's something that takes time. But the the way I imagine this to make money is through affiliate links. That's the most straightforward way. I have affiliate deals with other uh, tech YouTubers for their courses, mm -hmm. and when there is a paid course on Tutab, there's free stuff and paid stuff. And for the paid stuff, I usually put an affiliate affiliate link behind it. I just need much more traffic because before this will be a reasonable stream of income would you be comfortable sharing numbers um you mean users because yeah money yeah. money I was mean, like I mean, eight traffic, bucks traffic traffic how many um, hits your site gets and how and how you try to increase the traffic on your website yeah the problem is i don't have google analytics installed because i don't want all this cookie stuff at the moment on my website because in europe we have strict privacy laws and you can't just install google analytics uh so you don't million. want to deal with GDPR? Yeah, right. And it's also very intrusive, Google Analytics. It adds all this stuff. And I think the JavaScript on your website is also not that um, small. I don't know I don't know how much impact it has on the speed and everything because it adds JavaScript, right? And it, I mean, the, it has to do a network request to get this data where it belongs. I don't know. What I do is I... Is a, uh, a, track the searches that are done but anonymously of course mm -hmm. so i can see how many searches were done and at the moment it's like 100 searches per day that's the average at the moment and of course sometimes that's one person searching multiple times so i probably have less than 100 users per day but the website is pretty new. The Google rankings are still non-existent because the, uh, it doesn't have any authority. This just takes time to build. That's why I write blog posts now because this is a nice way to get exposure on Google and rank mm -hmm. there. I do some social media stuff where I create small pieces of content on Instagram and stuff like that. And this is how I try to market it. But you just have to be patient with this kind of stuff because, because this takes time. And building a block from scratch takes time. And yeah, I'm patient with this. But I think if I just continue writing blog posts over the next few months, then naturally the, the number of users will increase over time. I also think that um, the idea that you are building is absolutely amazing. You 
cause it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't explained it yet. Maybe people are confused if they're listening to this and I haven't explained. So Tuta by O is, is just an idea I had where I thought there are so many, uh, yeah, there are so many uh, blog posts of, uh, of the kind of 10 best JavaScript tutorials, for example. And I had this idea to build this website where people can submit links to resources. So those are just links to YouTube tutorials, to Udemy courses, whatever. And then, uh, as you can see, the community can up and downvote these resources. And this way, for every topic, for every search, the best resources uh, will naturally move to the top because they get the most upvotes. And this is the idea how this works, so that you can search, for example, for a JavaScript beginner tutorial, and then, yeah, you have to sign up before you can vote. And then uh, um, people, or then you will see, uh, yeah, it's, it's a limit of 50 <laughs> characters at the moment. And then you can see the best ones at the top because they have the most upvotes, right? That's the idea behind Except it. for the sponsored one. Yeah, that's the way, uh, That's those are the ones where I have special affiliate deals with the creators. So WebDev Simplified, for example, I have a affiliate deal with him and in return, I make it sponsored and there is one slot at the top, like it works on Google search basically, where there is this uh, one slot at the top where they get, a, um, how do I say it? It's not an organic result. They are put at the top because I have it's this It's a promoted result. It's a promoted result, right? But it's marked as sponsored, so people can see it. That's why it has zero upvotes, but it's still at the top. But it's only yeah, this one. And slot. I see that you already added added the breakdown by language, right? Yeah. And breakdown by level, format, yeah. and the type, whether it's free or a paid resource. Well, first of all, I think I need to um, post my courses here. Yeah, that's a good idea. See what's going on here, but in general. Um, Really, I think you were onto something very important here. Maybe because... I don't know. The thing is, sorry for interrupting. When I researched this idea, and I have to, I have to give them a shout out just to be fair. I had this idea all by myself, and it was my own original idea. But when I uh, searched if something like this already existed, I found another website that already does the same. It's called Hacker.io, Hacker without the ear, and but it doesn't seem. It seems almost dead because there isn't much new stuff on there anymore. And it's also a very slow website and they do it a bit differently. For example, they only have these broad categories, for example, Android, and they don't really have a search. They just have these categories and they only cover like full beginner courses that work as a full course. Whereas the idea of my website is to also have smaller courses and tutorials on there on specific topics. So if you're yeah, just interested they in learning, they have too yeah. many pop-ups. I'm looking at their yeah, website. Yeah, they have a ton of no. ton of ads on their website. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just uh, annoying. Yeah, but I think this idea is great, and I will, if you, if I might, as being an outsider because you are the business domain expert here. But I do have several courses, and I do have some videos, and I do have some blog posts. And what I find very appealing about this idea is that. Um, there is very few, um, well, at least I don't know about a resource uh, which would aggregate all of this information, as you said, not just mm. courses, but all the resources all together and allow people to come, uh, basically vote on these resources and this way promote them. Because, for example, in Google, which I use a lot and some of my blog posts are very highly ranked on Google, Google and I constantly deal with um, search engine optimization and I also optimize my website. but. Eventually, um, a lot of trash um, is being promoted on Google because there are all mm. these ways you can manipulate stuff and there is not, it's not guaranteed that the best resource will be the highest rated, right? And what you build is basically very similar to Stack Overflow, okay? Mm. So Google can kind of search your site maybe later when you expand it and you become very successful um, startup, but it's very important that you have all these um, ratings and people can actually vote on, on them, right? And can compare different aspects because some developers, um, they're totally fine paying for stuff while others don't want to invest any money. Mm -hmm. And just allowing people to break down by, by this factor is in my estimation already a huge, um, huge feature, right? Mm -hmm. 
So for example, the problem is I, that I need people who submit these resources in the first place. That's a bit of a bottleneck at the moment because I have to motivate people to uh, post these resources. Whereas on Google, you have everything all the time. Yeah, but it's also benefits uh, that maybe uh, maybe the worst resources don't even make it to the website because no one posts them. That's also a, a plus, maybe. But it's I uh, know it's, uh, we call it a chicken and egg problem, right? Once mm -hmm. you have a very big website, everybody <laughs> would like to post their resources and yeah, search I think so. search for content on your website. But how do you get to the point where you have a big website without someone posting stuff and searching on your website? But that's just what you said, right? It's just you know to grind. To grind and keep working yeah. and slowly you will improve the thing i really believe that you are onto something here and i really like the fact that you invest into you know into speed of the website i just checked your uh, uh google page speed inside very great job uh, yeah the bottleneck is, is, the, is the time it takes for the server to return these uh, results that's a bit of a, a thing i can't really change but all the all the other sites, the blog, for example, I I mean, it still doesn't have the best results. There is some stuff that I have to fix, especially on mobile for some reason. But I use Next.js on the front end, and they help you with a lot of stuff. For example, they allow you to uh, render some of these pages statically, so that uh, even if the data is coming from a database, it can create HTML from it that is just served like this. And it doesn't even have to make a, a, a request on the server anymore. You just have these different kind of options. Yeah, let's maybe show the viewers. Maybe they will like to understand how it works. So Google PageSpeed Inside is basically one of the most important um, performance metrics that your website should uh, account for. And Google basically measures the speed of your website on desktop and on mobile and gives you uh, the breakdown by different aspects of the performance. And also, if you have some problems, Google will help you identify them and then you can go and fix them. And we can see that on what desktop, your website scores mm. almost- That's the front page. It doesn't really have to fetch any data there. That's why it's so fast. But if you try a, a URL where we search for something like this one, yeah, then it will be slower because it has to make a request on the database. So it has naturally has to wait a little bit. Yeah, so this would be slower. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. For example, we see this cu uh, cumulative layout shift, for example. This is something that Next.js, for example, helps you with. That's why I'm really a fan of it. This means, for example, when you uh, lo uh, load a large image and you didn't set it up properly, uh, sometimes uh, all the rest of the layout moves below, moves down because the image suddenly pops into its position after it's loaded. Yeah, next, well, I think yeah. everyone knows what, what this thing does because even though Google okay. measures that for you and will punish you for that, if you go to your Gmail inbox, then <laughs> <laughs> when you try to click on the first uh, email in your inbox, after a second, there will be one or two uh, promoted result, promoted <laughs> stuff appear there. So inevitably, once or twice a day, you click on before, or basically ads. So yeah, that's it's really what annoying. Cumulative layout shift is, and I see that still you've got very. High I didn't expect this. I didn't know that it has still this got good results. Maybe it and, doesn't count. Yeah, mobile yeah, is so low. For reason. Yeah, and on mobile you have some problems that you should fix. And but it's the as same far as I know, currently Google ranks by mobile results. So mobile performance is much more important okay. than desktop performance. But so I don't yeah, understand why. Why is the blocking time ten, 10 times as much as on desktop? It's the exact same page that is loaded. Just the layout is different. I don't know why it takes so much longer. You see, time to first byte. That's something that probably you can fix. Maybe you have some uh, bottleneck in, um, in in the connection. And also, but also first... that, 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 that being said, um, this page doesn't show up in Google. So maybe it doesn't matter at all. I mean, the, maybe the, I don't know if it still counts pages that don't show up or only the ones that are actually indexed. But this, the search page does shouldn't appear in Google as a result. But the blog post, ah, you disabled example, you disabled it for uh, for ranking in Google. Um, not directly, but if you don't put the the page into the sitemap, then Google needs some kind of link to find it in the first place. And some of these actually show up in Google because I've posted it somewhere, and Google found it this way. But Google doesn't fix it. I mean the. Whatever you type it in search, you, yeah. as, as, as long as you have this link from your homepage, yeah, to this true. Page, this is this, Google yeah, true. Knows this is how I, 
Okay, that's a good point. This is how Google found it. I was wondering why some of these show up in Google. It's because of these links, right? Yeah, yeah. Google bots but, are very, very sophisticated yeah. in uh, crawling your website. So you can pretty be pretty sure that everything that's linked together, you don't mm. even need a sitemap for that. They will do it automatically for you. I've never uploaded any sitemap for any website. And mm. Google actually... I do because I do some... Stuff. Yeah, but I do because I do some programmatic um, SEO. What I did is for, it's a bit hard to explain. Um, I mean, can you go into the into the URL of the current page and instead of the question mark at the end of the resources, type a slash. Yeah, remove the question mark as well. Then topics, slash, and then for example, Android. And then uh, I, render, I render these pages like a blog post. Um, so they are optimized for Google. And what I do is I have a huge array with hundreds of different keywords that are all put into a sitemap, but I just did this a few days ago. So they are not showing, or a lot of them are not showing up in Google yet. But these pages here are solely meant to be indexed by Google for SEO reasons. So those are basically the, the first 11 results of the search. And I rendered the description there as well. So it's basically uh, structured like a blog post and I have a huge array just of strings with different keywords that I put into the sitemap so Google can find them. That's the idea behind this. And the goal of this is to just rank for a ton of these different combinations of keywords. Yeah. Okay, you, you're trying to figure out your SEO approach, which is great. And that's something that yeah. you should definitely think about. But just a recommendation for someone who will... <laughs> deal with SEO for quite a bit of time, don't, don't overestimate how much you can kind of game it because mm. at the end of the day, Google is very good at identifying what people look for and which websites yeah. provide the information they look for. So if your website, let's say someone lands on your uh, JavaScript, let's say, page, and if Google sees that they landed on this page and they spend quite a bit of time here, from their perspective, your resource is interesting and you already get SEO bonus points. So you don't actually need to help Google much figure it out. And I don't know, maybe yeah. what you did is great and will help the, you, right, the, but the problem, features yeah, the problem are is, always better. Right, but the problem is that um, without these generated pages, I would just not have a Google entry for a lot of these combinations, only the ones that are linked on the front page. But... Um, Android navigation component, for example, those are things I would really like to show up in Google search results if I have several tutorials for that. And unless I have that linked somewhere or in the sitemap, it won't show up. But I think I can get a lot of traffic just by people searching on, on Google for Android navigation component or best Unity tutorials or Unity how to make a 2D game or stuff like that. So this is why I try to generate these uh, different pages. And they yeah, are but eventually Google. you also have a blog, right? And you just right. that's exactly what you write here, right? How to learn. But that's a very fast. slow, but that's an extremely slow process because these blogs take these posts take time and ranking with them takes time as well. Yeah, so but I, I would estimate that this approach will be much faster than that one, to be honest. Yeah. Because that's what I try Google both. really likes. So we'll see about that, but in general, I think you are onto something here. And even though you want it to be a lifestyle bootstrap business, I do see it growing much more than $100 a month. So hopefully nice. you will get there quickly. Yeah, and this reminds Time me that I need to put my own content here to make sure that I also capture part of your traffic. <laughs> so now that you're out of YouTube business, what would be your recommendation to someone who attempts to get to the point where you've been today? Mm. Like if someone wants to create a YouTube business uh, explaining about programming, let's say. Or actually, I'm not sure I'm not sure that programming has that much of a uniqueness to it. Maybe it's a general mm. advice, but let's just concentrate on programming. I want to create a YouTube channel on programming. And I really do. <laughs> what hmm. what would be your advice to me? I mean, first of all, you have to make sure that you uh, enjoy it. Otherwise, you have the same problem as me, that you start hating it after a while. And then you have people like Philip Lackner who really like doing that stuff and they really take off because he's willing to put in eight, nine hours every day to work on this stuff. 
And otherwise, you just have to put in effort. A lot of people are just lazy when they make videos or blog posts. They basically just copy the documentation. <clears throat> and sometimes this can work. Um, there are a lot of tutorials, I think, which are basically just people reading the documentation for you and presenting them in a, in a video form. And some people just don't want to read. They just want to see someone doing something. But the, the only reason my videos were so popular is because I put a ton of effort into them. But this was also the downfall at the same time. So I don't really have a tip because what I did was not uh, uh, sustainable for me. The same thing that made my videos popular is also the reason why I quit the channel in the end, because it was too much effort. Yeah, I and I would estimate that you are kind of a pedantic person, right? It's not like you could downshift your um I don't know quality. what pedantic means. <laughs> I, I don't know what pedantic means. Um, maybe it's not a real world in English. <laughs> maybe perfectionist. Or is perfectionist, or? yeah. That's called perfectionist, exactly. Yeah, with are the videos I was... Yeah, I uh, I had this problem. Yeah, and I still have it with my blog posts. Before I release a blog post, I go through it so often, and but it, it also leads to quality. So I don't even know if that's a that's a downside. The blog posts I write on Tutab I I think they are really good because I put a ton of effort into it into them, and they are often thousand. I mean, I don't have many yet, but most of them are like two or three, four thousand words long. And I really, uh, there's no fluff in there. And yeah, I think making something of quality is just a nice way uh, to uh, get the stuff to take off. That's definitely for sure. Uh, there is a market for quality out there because most of the stuff you get, whatever the niche is, is basically yeah. crap. Yeah. But even, even get, the higher... Let's get back. Uh, Higher results on Google. I was surprised how much of that is still crap. A lot of the stuff reads like it was written by AI. And so there's still room. There's still room to create proper. The problem content. that I found with Google is that they really do a good job of giving the people what they enjoy, let's say. Hmm. But what people enjoy is not always what they need. Yeah, so, yeah. for example, I've got this very also, I write very long articles, usually way too long for most people. And I try to kind of cover the advanced stuff. I try, try to, bring, but eventually no one reads that, right? And then someone goes and reads that, how to build a simple app in, in Android. So there's definitely some kind of a, of, of, of a deadlock that needs to be resolved here. So on the one hand, you, you want to have a high traffic, but on the other hand, you also don't want to just give people what they want because then you kind of sacrifice the quality. That, that's why it's important when you uh, when you write a very detailed blog post with advanced stuff that you uh, uh, you structure it with separate headlines and create small sections and you should write a conclusion at the end so people can just scroll there and read that if they don't want if they don't want to read the whole thing. So I think you can work around this by uh, just not writing a, one huge block of text but separating so that people can either get into the details or just. Um, read whatever they need right now. So this is what I think you can work around this because writing a detailed blog post should be good for SEO if you structure it properly because you have more words and it answers more questions than a smaller blog post. But let's say someone do does want to start a YouTube channel right now. They don't know anything about it. So what's the first thing uh, they do? Except for um, actually starting the channel. I mean, how yeah, they that's start. That's what I was, I was about to say because that's what people most of just don't do they they just postpone it so mm. uh, the thing uh, um i mean i don't want to blow my own horn i just want to say the the reason why uh, i do this kind of stuff like this website or the youtube channel is because i'm very impatient with this kind of stuff and when i have this idea i just start at the same day when i had the idea to start youtube videos at the same day i made the channel and i made two videos already on the same day and you just have to start with this kind of stuff when you get a foot in the door, you then start naturally improving over time. But there are so many people who just have this idea and then they they keep postponing it forever. And I don't really get it because I'm way too impatient to wait with this kind of stuff. So just create a channel and record something. I don't uh, don't worry for now how the quality is. Um, the first few videos I made, I mean, I actually had a different channel before I started coding in Flow, a German channel where I did something completely different. 
But for my very first video there, I actually used my iPhone back then as the microphone. I didn't have any equipment. I just wanted to get my first video out as quickly as possible. And for the first few videos also, you probably feel like an imposter because it feels unnatural to do this stuff. You feel like the first video I made, I felt like I was I was a child playing a role uh, of someone who is making a video, not someone who actually makes videos. It, it was really weird. It just didn't feel natural at all. But you have to expect this and just start and then just keep improving from there. Uh, that's not really anything you can do beforehand, I think. You shouldn't uh, you shouldn't read a ton of articles on how to start a YouTube channel. You should just start one, I guess, and make your first video. And then over time, you will learn how to make the videos better. Or is there well, anything else you would add to that? I, I, think, really I think we will leave it at that because <laughs> I think anything yes. added to that is just an extra unneeded information mm. because um, I do agree with you. And my biggest mistake with YouTube was that I started to invest a lot of effort into my first videos. I mean, mm. the first video probably took several days for me to create and edit and everything. The problem so is when you put a lot of effort into something or too much effort and are too perfectionist with it, it can take the... It can re completely remove the fun out of it. This is what mm -hmm. happened for my uh, podcast because I made this podcast and I enjoyed doing the interviews, but I immediately started uh, creating all these small social media posts from it and I spent so much time with the stuff around it that one day I just thought, holy shit, I don't want to do this one more minute. It's just mm -hmm. totally miserable because I, I, did, I just did too much. Um, even though working hard is important, it's also important that you keep the fun in something. And sometimes this means not doing uh, doing less, basically, if that makes sense. Yeah, it actually does make sense because you need to kind of calibrate what you can do. And if right. you try to do too much, right. you fail and you need to you need to build your your first steps on successes. You cannot just right. fail right of right out of the gate and that this will kill your motivation. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely recommend like just leave it at that. Your your advice is actually very um, very good. Just start and do whatever it is and don't wor worry about quality. And also quality wise, I spent maybe three months creating my first course on Dagger for Udemy, paid course. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get the quality great. I just sat and, and I re-recorded all the videos times after times after times after. And I create, I, I it, it turned out to be okay. But then I realized that if I would just create this course as quickly as possible and then iterate over it or create another one, the quality would improve much faster because eventually I I discovered that what I considered to be a good quality at the very beginning was actually shitty quality because you just you cannot create a good quality without practice. It's not something that you can do. So you need practice. And to do practice, to get experience, to practice, you need to do what you've just said. You need to just start. All other things are less important. So yeah, I definitely try to. I mean, I'm a perfectionist too. It's a problem. It's a big problem. And I definitely try to kind of always um, tell myself, you don't need to overinvest in that. It's difficult. It's not something that comes easy. Yeah. So um, let's just maybe jump a little bit into the tech stack of .hub.io. I'm really curious to hear how you built it and what problems you encountered while building it and what's your let's say six months of a roadmap, or maybe you don't mm -hmm. have six months, let's say three months of roadmap ahead of you. How do you see that? Um, ahead of me is mostly uh, marketing stuff to uh, get more users, also some more small features I want to add. And the tech stack I use is on the front end, it's Next.js, which is basically React with some extra features. And React is very similar to Jetpack Compose on Android. Uh, what some people here probably know, it's the same concept basically. I think Jetpack Compose was built with uh, with uh, React as the original idea, I guess. Um, 
That's one tip I can give right now is that if SEO plays any role at all for your website, then you should not use normal React because in normal React, you basically just have a single page. So uh, if you build a blog, for example, with plain React, then these blog posts by default won't show up in Google because they're technically not separate pages. It's all just loaded with JavaScript into this one shell of a page that you have. It works like an app, basically. And Next.js is, is another framework on top of React that lets you decide for every page if you want to uh, render it on the server or if you want to render it on the client. And it also does some other stuff for you. So Next.js is really nice. I would probably always use it over normal React these days. And for the backend, I use Node.js with Express. I haven't tried anything else. Maybe there are better alternatives, but it's just all JavaScript or TypeScript, so I don't have to learn another language or use another language. And for the database, I use MongoDB with MongoDB Atlas, which is their hosted um, service where you don't have to host the database yourself on your server, but they do it for you. And even though it's a bit expensive, I pay like almost 70 bucks, I think, per month for this. But I just like the convenience you get for that because they have everything bucks for you. bucks to host yeah, the database? Yeah, but they also do backups and all this stuff for you. And they have a more sophisticated search feature, which is important for my website. Where is so that? They have you host it on AWS? Um, no, it's MongoDB Atlas. It's basically MongoDB's own hosting service. Mm. So it's their own, their own company that does this. And but they don't host your website, right? No, they don't host the website. The website is hosted on Vercel, who are the guys who created Next.js. So Next.js is free, but they make money with the hosting service, which is just optimized for Next.js. Doesn't it have the latency that you host your website and your database on different servers? Um, yeah, it, it probably has an effect on that. I just made sure that the servers are in the same location, in the same area. But yeah, they are on different servers. The the backend is hosted on uh, the backend itself runs on Hostinger, which is a hosting service. And right, actually, it's tr it's three different places basically. But Vazel has a CDN, a content delivery network. So I think um, where you get the the page from depends on your location. So it's optimized mm -hmm. for that. And I mean, the search is, is very fast. So. Uh, it doesn't seem like a problem right now. But I don't want to host my own database because it seems like a headache to me a little bit. Because you have to take care of backups, for example. You have to take care of a lot of other stuff. Um, how, how difficult do you think would backup for MongoDB be? I don't know, but a few articles I read about that made it seem like a headache. <laughs> and. I've I wrote maybe 10 lines of code to automate oh, this, including okay. uploading it to, to AWS S, S3 server. But what they also do for you is that they don't have one database running, but three different ones, I think, in case one of them goes down. And I don't think how this works when you host it on your own server, because if do my server really, is down... Do you really need that? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, <laughs> one more, but one more reason. <laughs> they have a different search functionality here. And search is the core feature of my website. So this is really important. And they have a more sophisticated search functionality than normal MongoDB. So this is what I'm using right now. And I'm so invested into it right now that uh, I can't really uh, think about switching. Yeah. That's, but the thing that's, is, that's the biggest problem uh, with uh, yeah. all these, um, how they call it, uh, IaaS, infrastructure as a service solutions. Once you become once you adopt any of them, yeah, um, vendor lock. You become you become kind of locked in. Yeah. But the thing is, seventy bucks is is a lot right now because the site doesn't make a lot of money yet. But let's say the website starts making money. I don't think uh, I need a much higher plan on Atlas. So, relatively speaking, the seventy bucks very soon maybe uh, are not relevant anymore. So this is why it's not really worth for me uh, switching right now. Let's say yeah. the website makes 3,000 bucks a month, then 70 bucks doesn't really matter much anymore. This is why I don't I would really say see a just, you know, like my, my gut feeling. And again, what you did is amazing because most developers wouldn't be able to bootstrap their own website at all. I mean, including web developers. 
I know web developers who they will work, let's say, for a big company and they know some framework amazingly, but then you tell them, okay, here, like, like create some server and bootstrap your, like, like create a full website, not just, you know, add features to an existing web page. And they wouldn't know how to do that. You know, they have maybe DevOps people handling the servers and hmm. uh, some other people handling the CI pipelines. And like eventually they just write the front end code, let's say, or the back end code, but they don't have the whole picture in mind. So what you've built is absolutely amazing in my estimation. And that's Thanks. why I'm sure that like, that's just the start for you. I'm sure that your startup will be very successful and hopefully one day we will just, you know, just, just like Stack Overflow uh, became kind of de facto standard for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. We need some de facto standard for comparing resources, educational resources. Yeah, and there is a huge business for that because, for example, in Udemy, one of the most important features that you have are reviews, right? So they constantly prompt people for reviews. Uh, and there's, there are some problems with, with these reviews, like there are draw, drawbacks in addition to benefits, but as a general trade-off, you do want these reviews. You do want people to be able to see that. And what you build will allow, for example, yeah, that's why I added a comment feature resources. recently. That's why I added a comment feature so people have a place where they can actually write or say something about the resource. Yeah, I just yeah, added this recently. Uh, generally, I, I think that what you've what you've got could really run on top of one digital ocean droplet that costs six dollars mm. a month in total. Yeah, I mean, we'll sell uh, it's another twenty bucks per month, what? but they're really optimized for Next.js. So Bazel, the, the front-end hosting is another 20 bucks. Yeah, I mean, you paid for convenience and otherwise mm, you yeah. would need to invest time to, you know, to set up everything yourself, set up a load balance, not load balance, you don't need load balance, how do you call it, reverse proxies, like Nginx, mm. you would need to set up to understand how but you I have work that, it. I had to do that anyway, because only the database is somewhere else, but my server is still on my own back-end hosting. So ah, I so still you have host your back-end on a VPS, on virtual private server? Right. Yeah, on hosting. Oh, so you just host the front end on some hosting? Yeah, some it's platform? basically three different places, I guess. The mm. front end is on Bazel, the server is the Node.js server is on Hostinger, and then the the web uh, the database is hosted as well. But I don't really see a different way to handle this unless I want to put the database on my server. Yeah, I mean the front end and the back end things are probably not that big of a problem, but uh, once your backend and database are not co-located, it, it can create problems, especially if people, you know, like navigate your website. But again, it works all right. I see mm. the stats are perfectly fine and um, it's very responsive, especially compared to that other website that you just uh, said, <laughs> Hacker.io, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing how it looks really. And I like, I really like the sleek look of it. So. Let's just uh, show it once again, because it's really amazing what you've built here. Yeah, I can also say uh, how I picked the colors as a site that's called, uh, I don't know, I think Coolor. Uh, I forgot the, the domain ending, where you can create different color combinations. And I'm not good with design normally, but I think the colors are good this time. I like the gold and dark blue combination really much. I didn't find any alternative colors that I liked more. But I found it because of this one website where you can select color palettes. So basically, no designer was involved in this website at any stage. You designed no. everything yourself. There was no one in, uh, except me for anything besides posting resources. This is what users do. That's why you can see all these images of these users on the site. And that's one way I want to motivate them. I want to give them credit for posting these resources. And I also started this raffle where people can win a Udemy uh, uh, coupon code every month. This is just how I try to motivate people. And I want to increase these prices when the website makes more money because I think this could work. Uh, I could motivate people by starting raffles, starting these giveaways. So everyone who posts a resource, only a single one per month automatically participates in this raffle. And this is just how I try to motivate people more to post something because posting a link takes like two or three minutes depending how much text you write there. And it gives a chance to uh, win something. So I think this could work. 
just have to see, I have to try out different stuff. I would imagine that the way it should work is that once you've got a big enough platform, content creators will be posting their own links here. It yeah, will be basically right. just, just like you submit uh, your website to Google hmm. and content creators would like to post on your website to make sure that it's visible. So I don't think you will actually need to do that. And the only thing hmm. is, you know, monetization and stuff, you'll need to figure that out. But again, once you've got enough traffic, monetization will be, there are people who can help you with that. So. Uh, I mean, I think affiliate links could work because, um, I mean, on Udemy, for example, you only get 10% commission, but all the deals I made with other YouTubers, I get like often a 30, 40 or 50% commission on affiliate sales. Yeah. I mean, right now I, uh, I don't have any, uh, I mean, um, people really wait before they buy uh, an expensive course. So right now there's not enough traffic yet to actually sell any of these affiliate courses, but eventually they will, when there's enough traffic. And for some of these courses, I get half of the price goes to yeah, me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that good at, at business, actually. <laughs> so I cannot comment on your business idea, business uh, and how you call it, business model, right? Yeah, just want to avoid putting ads on the website because ads make the website really ugly, really fast. Yeah, I would say if you if you want to create a quality business, ads is not exactly the best way. And anyways, you know, for ads uh, to be meaningful you need like millions of clicks every mm. month so yeah. once you get there you probably don't won't need ads at all because even on um, udemy affiliates you can make a lot of more money than on ads but in general yeah it's a great great idea i i think it's it's basically required and if you if you will be the one who built this thing and who make it popular well good for us because you came you no, know, you come from the background. You're not just some business guy having the idea. You know the ins and outs of this thing. And you also have connections. So uh, I'm, I'm really, I really hope that uh, your idea ramps up and you manage to turn it into a legitimate business. Yeah, thanks. I hope so too. But yeah, I was in a good position to build this because I made tutorials myself and I just know what people want, I guess. Exactly. And I see that, for example, you have 17 upvotes here, which, which means that probably several hundreds of people saw that mm. post, right? Because yeah. I cannot upvote it without signing up for, yeah. uh, for your yeah. website. So I guess it means that your website is already ramping up. And the only thing that you need is a nice chart of, um, of number of users that mm. you get on your website daily, because even though you want to create this as a bootstrap business, I would estimate that you have a very good chance of turning it into also venture back business at some point, if you ever feel a need for more manpower, because that's, yeah. that's basically why people seek and look for investment, right? Once you know that you can, let's say 10 X your product by taking external money and sharing some percentage of your company with the investors, it's a very good idea to take that money. The, but, but what you can also do is just wait until it makes enough money and then just hire people from the from the money the website makes. What I could imagine definitely is outsourcing all the marketing stuff, writing blog posts and stuff like that. I don't really want to do that. I would just like to code and add new features. And I would like to outsource all the other stuff once I have the money for that. Writing yeah. So for, posts, writing for example, if you would have, if you would have, like, I mean, I'm not trying to convince you again, I, I'm a failing businessman myself, so <laughs> not, not in the position of giving advice on the business side, but just imagine that like you you take some money from somewhere and you can hire guys like um, hit subscribe, the service that I showed hmm. before, and they come in and they take on uh, for this SEO, they help you with that. They write blog posts uh, and the people who write blog posts there are like industry insiders, right? They're developers themselves. These are not just some random people. They pick them very carefully. Okay. So you, you would be able to do quite a bit with some external money at some point. But again, uh, like that's your decision. And I hope that this website will be successful enough so that 
you have all the options open in front of you and then you need to choose and not just, you know. Yeah, I'm just scared of hiring other developers because I, you can do a lot of damage if you hire bad developers and they just screw it up. Yeah, at some point, you know, if you if you want to scale anything, you will need to mm. learn to delegate. That's true. I that, totally understand your true. point because I myself I'm very bad at delegating and I'm like free control and you know. Yeah, I didn't I, even want to delegate uh, editing videos and stuff like that because I always felt like other others don't get it right. But that's a big weakness to not be able yeah. to do that. That's that's a that's a big minus and that's something that I constantly yeah. try to improve for myself because. I find it very difficult to delegate stuff, especially when mm. it comes to technical stuff. Like, I mean, you know, building infrastructure for something, I know for sure that I can do it much better than anyone else. But mm. at the end of the day, you need to decide what you do, right? So, so at some point, if this website will be successful enough, you will, if not if, when this website will be successful enough, you will need to decide that you have more important stuff to do than, to, than writing front-end features. And at that point, mm. you will need someone to help you. Maybe, but that's also the part I enjoy. So maybe I just do this for four hours per day the rest of the next years. Maybe it could work this way. But maybe yeah. I, I should hire people. No, you don't. You, you shouldn't do anything. Don't don't take what you, what I say as an advice. That's just you the know my, is, my thoughts a lot. But what I mean is that yeah. once you get to the point where you're successful, you will have just so many paths you can go. Yeah. that you will need just to choose your own way. And that would be amazing. And I really yeah. hope that you will get there as soon as possible. Nice. Okay. So I think that will be a great place to end this episode. I'm sure that we will have more discussions later. And um, I have a, had a very... Um, that, that was very... Pleasant. I wanted to talk to you for a very, very long time to hear your perspective, to understand where you come from and hear your story. So any parting words uh, for the viewers? Um, do I have to say something meaningful? <laughs> no. You don't need to change their lives with the words that you say right now. Yeah. That's not if, someone, if someone wants to start a YouTube channel, there is enough demand for it, I think, um, for good content. So... Uh, just try it out and there are still newer channels popping up frequently uh, with people who uh, make tutorials and they uh, take off after a while. So if you think that's something you can enjoy, then just try it out. And you can make money from creating courses if you like that. Yeah, that's for sure. And today it's even easier than ever before in my estimation. You can create courses your own, you can create courses on yeah. Udemy, you can there are many options out there. So let's just put once again uh, the link to oh, our nice. website, .hub.io, uh, and I expect every single person who watched this uh, podcast up until this point to just log in and create an account on .hub.io and nice. help <laughs> yeah, push thanks. this thing forward because the world just absolutely needs a platform, a place where... People can see different resources, learning resources, and can um, compare them, can read reviews by other people, and make and basically make sure that they can find the best materials out there. Nice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for agreeing to uh, speak with me, and I hope we'll do that again Yeah, we uh, should soon. repeat this one one day yeah. yeah once once your website crosses one million viewers per month nice. we will do that so basically in six months right yeah i hope so <laughs> but then uh, i don't sit in the same room anymore then i sit in my in my huge house somewhere. yeah of course of course of course we will, you will need to basically ask all the girls to go out <laughs> and you know to clean the the coke out of uh, yeah out but of i already table. have to do this now <laughs> so this is, uh, that's already my lifestyle anyway as a YouTuber. No, exactly. Just kidding. You folks out there, all nerds who want to start YouTube channels, just know that if your coding channel is successful, girls will be all over you all the time. <laughs> that's the main message of this podcast. Okay, great, Florian. I'm really glad we did that and we'll do that again. And yeah, for all of you folks out there, take care and until next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.